And what I don't realize is I'm fearful of losing what I have. Pattern recognition is a big deal. Just by noticing that and realizing that, we know that we need to either package in A and B because people are going to ask for it. If we don't fix it, what's it likely to cost us over the next 12, 24 months? Those low margin customers, those low margin projects are the ones that are the most demanding and have the most wear and tear on your staff. Maui Mastermind presents the Business Coach Podcast, answering your questions and providing real actionable insights for building a better, stronger, more profitable business without sacrificing your time, life, or freedom anymore. Well, welcome back to The Business Coach. In this episode, I want to talk about a, something that's an insidious thing in many businesses that the owners aren't even aware of called scope creep. Scope creep, broadly defined, is when a business gives more than what was asked because customers are demanding it or businesses staff members unwittingly give extra in such a way that it actually puts the entire business at risk of failure. Right? Scope creep hurts margins, hurts profitability, and over the long term can actually hurt the viability or even kill a company. And so we're going to dive into examples of what scope creep is, how to spot it, and then I'm going to share with you seven ways to combat scope creep. How do you know if it's happening in your business and what do you do about it? And I'm going to start off by sharing a story here. So I want to share the story about Tina who owned a CPA firm in the South. Now Tina was a very bright um, business person, but scope creep is something that happens very subtly in the background. And usually it sneaks up on you. It's why we don't call it scope, hit you over the head with a mallet. We call it scope creep. It just slowly kind of rolls in. And before you know it, you're like, wow, I'm underwater in an area of the business. So Tina ran a CPA firm. Now the CPA firm she ran did two main things. They did what's called monthly write-up, where they would, you know, if you were a small business owner client, each month they would look at your financials, uh, close out your, your books, uh, do bank account reconciliations, give the owner um, financial reporting for, for that business. And that would be an ongoing thing 12 months out of the year, year after year. The second part of their business was more seasonal. It was their tax practice. And they didn't have a high-end strategy practice, but they did a lot of tax preparation. They weren't really tax strategists, but tax preparation. And seasonally, that became a fairly large part, then shrunk down. And Tina came to us because she was working exceptionally hard, 65, 70 hours a week. But her practice was not very profitable, and she didn't know why it was. I know there's a little bit of an irony with that. Here she is, a financial expert, a CPA. Why is my business not profitable? This is how insidious scope creep is. You don't even notice it when you're inside it. You know, As a person from the outside, as her business coach, when she came to us years ago, it was easy to see. Matter of fact, um, I reviewed her financials. I had about a half an hour conversation, and all kinds of alarm bells were going off inside of me. Uh, I, I'm a Star Trekkie fan, so I don't know if I got any other Trekkies watching or listening to this, but there used to be this fancy alarm that would go off on the bridge of the Enterprise that was going whoop, 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 and that was what my intuition was doing. You know, one of the things as a business coach, pattern recognition is a big deal. I don't just have exposure to the dozen of companies that I've been an equity player or, or the prime owner of, but I have access to over what, several thousand businesses that I've directly coached over the years. And so I start seeing patterns and scope creep is a common pattern. And so I asked her to do something. I said, you know, Tina, I want you to do, uh, we have a tool called the margin analysis. I want you to break down your customers by profitability. Specifically, I want you to look at the gross profitability of each of your recurring customers, each of your clients. And just a reminder for you, uh, if I take revenue, total sales, and subtract off of their cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold is just a fancy way of saying, what did it cost me to directly produce my product or service? In a CPA firm doing accounting work, it would be the accountant or CPA time. It would be um, admins who are directly producing client work during that time. It could be in cases of certain software subscriptions that they have for that part. You could contribute a portion of the overhead of the business that's used if a Half the business is people doing direct work. You could use half the overhead. You don't really need typically to do that part of it, and most um, professional service firms won't do that. But the direct cost, mostly it's staff and labor, in this case for the CPA practice. And what you're left with when this is all said and done is gross profit. 
It's the profit you have after you paid for the cost of producing your product or service, but before all the other expenses that you have of generalized uh, overhead, sales, marketing, etc. So you can express that gross profit as a percent of, of the revenue. We call that a gross profit margin. So when she did this analysis and looked at her customers by gross profit, here's what she discovered. The gross profit margin of about a third of her clients was fantastic, right where it should be. We call these bucket A clients for her. These bucket A clients were profitable. They paid on a timely basis. They were fairly enjoyable to work with, right? They were the easy clients to work with. Then she had a second grouping of people. We'll call this bucket B. Bucket B clients, they were mixed margins, right? They were, they were profitable, but not nearly as profitable as A. Some of them were slower to pay. Many of them still were a little bit more challenging, but, but in general, they were not as good as A, but still better than this group, which I'll call bucket C, which broke down in her business to about a third of her clients. Roughly one third of her clients fell into bucket C. And bucket C clients were break even gross profit or a negative gross profit, which means, by the way, I still have to pay all my other expenses before I'm left over with any kind of ultimate operating profit. So if you're break even or, or, or small profit here, you're going to be losing money when it comes to the bottom line. And that's what she discovered. She was with these clients. These were primarily historic clients that she'd been working with for over a decade. And over time, these clients had asked for a little bit more service, a little bit more of this. Oh, I need the reporting formatted this way and that way. And they were demanding such that they were very poor margin clients. Plus, these were clients that were her slowest to pay clients. Some of these were receivables that were close to a year um, dated, wherein they've owed her money for almost a year here, and yet they're negative margin. And I pointed this out to her. I said, well, th we need to fix this. Um, she had a reaction that's very common, very common. Again, I've I've worked with thousands of business owners, and I've pointed this out to hundreds of them. They almost invariably have the exact same reaction. I said, Tina, right now you're at capacity, and you're wasting capacity serving clients that are difficult to work with, pay you very slowly, and at the same time you're losing money. You're literally paying to work with these clients. So we need to immediately either raise pricing on these people or help them work with some other CPA firm. Her first response was, again, this is very typical, but wait, if I raise pricing or do something or diminish services that I offer to right size the contract, I'll lose them as a client. That was her first gut level reaction. And I'm, I'm sharing this with you because this is very common for a business owner who will have this gut level reaction of saying, hmm, I've got scope creeps come in here has made these types of customers, these types of clients, for me, this type of business for me very marginal or even unprofitable. And what I don't realize is I'm fearful of losing what I have, even if it's bad. And this is very common for business owners. And this is where scope creep sneaks in there. So scope creep defined is when you've got an agreed upon uh, body of work. You're going to produce X, Y, and Z for a customer or for a client. And you've agreed you would do that for a certain fee, whether that's a one-time upfront, you know, $125,000 to do a remodel of a kitchen. Or whether that's a recurring service, like for example, for Tina, it might be two or $3,000 a month to do your business's monthly um, write-up work from an accounting side of, of things. And you've agreed that it's a body of work, X, Y, and Z, but then the customer, the client, asks for A and B. And your staff unwittingly does those things and even offers C without charging for it. Before you know, you've, you price this, but you've delivered this, and, and you wonder where your profitability is. It's eroded your gross profit margin. And it leads to a real trap. It leads to a trap where people start saying, I can't, I have to take this, be, this business. I have to take these unprofitable products or service lines that I have to do, or these types of customers, or serve these markets, because if I don't have this revenue, my business will grind to a halt. And what they don't realize is by not dealing with this problem and just saying, I just got to sell more, I've got to keep this business, that slowly over time, scope creep becomes like a vine that literally strangles their company. It strangles it. But David, <laughs> if I call them on the scope creep and change pricing or reduce services delivered 
or product size delivered, um, I'll lose them as a customer. And I'd say, well, I'd rather you lose customers that you make no money on so that you have freed up energy to go find more A bucket customers or product lines or, or project types or, or market niches versus the other. Scope creep is rarely a one-time issue. Um, it really isn't. Many people think, oh, it's just this one customer, and they, they rationalize it away. You know, Tina would say, oh, it's just this one customer. Yes, they're difficult to work with. Or, hey, someone else might say, it's just this type of project for this particular one. But rarely, I mean, again, I'm, I'm telling you, I've worked with thousands of businesses. Those that have scope creep, it's not a one-off thing. It's something that affects a, a large sub-percentage of their business. It might start off with one customer or one type of project or one type of customer lead that these are a type of customer that's more demanding. But it, if you give in to scope creep in one spot, it becomes endemic. What I mean by that is it, it becomes part of much of your business, 20, 30, 40% of your business. There are common patterns for scope creep. I'm going to give another example. So one of the clients we coached for a number of years, Gary, he ran a, a, a firm that he was a consultant that came in to help nonprofits um, do fundraising. So you would bring him in, for example, let's say you wanted to raise, which put some numbers to this. Let's say you wanted to do a, a, a fundraising campaign and you wanted to raise $10 million for your fund manning, fund, fundraising campaign. Gary and his company would come in and they would price that and they would say, okay, you're going to pay us $250,000 and we're going to help you successfully raise this $10 million. Um, and they would do that. And generally in their business, they would say, okay, we're going to produce for you X, Y, and Z. This is what we'll do to you, do for you. And we're expecting, they wouldn't tell a customer this or the client, they're expecting a 70% gross profit margin. That's, that's for their business of what they were looking to do. When I was coaching with them, it was very clear that they actually found that most of their customers, or at least a large percentage, would also ask for or they would just give them A, B, and C as well, which would take their 70% gross profit margin and drop it down so they were running an average of about a 58% gross profit margin. Now, a couple ways to look at that. One way of looking at that is saying, well, David, we're only talking about you know, a 12% difference. <laughs> That's all we're talking about is the delta. But that 12% represented all their owner profit and even a portion of their um, expenses that they had, which means that they were actually running at a loss because they kept eroding their margin. By, in their case, their cost of goods sold was their time and their subcontracting consultants that would come in and produce the work. It was a big, big deal. So scope creep is, is a way of saying that's basically a way of saying that, hey, we've just reduced our price. When we talk about scope creep, again, we've agreed that a certain body of work, and you're going to price that in our example here, $250,000. If I all of a sudden now give you, you know, 10, 15 percent more, but I charge the same 250, it's the same way of just saying I've reduced my price. And now when you put it in that frame, what you realize is if I reduce my price with the same cost, of course my profitability has to take a, a nosedive down as well. Now how does the average business owner deal with scope creep? Here's my experience. The average business owner um, pretends it doesn't exist. They behave like a four-year-old child. There's no monsters under the bed, David. There's no monsters under the bed. They, they literally ignore and pretend like it doesn't happen. Um, or they're just oblivious, they're unaware of it. And when I point it out to them, invariably their number one solution, they say, their number one solution, they say, is I just need to sell more. <laughs> but if I sell more and I have scope creep as an endemic issue inside my business, all I'm gonna do is sell myself into a deeper hole. When you're in the bottom of a hole and you find yourself digging, the best thing to do is not to dig faster and deeper. The best thing to do is to stop digging and to figure it out differently. And, and this is something you'll see with a lot of business people, that when they're in that hole <laughs> and they notice they have scope creep, they say, okay, I'm going to work hard, I'm going to grind it out, I'm going to sell more, more, more. And of course, as a result of that, they just have more scope creep, which means they have more negative margin business, which means they have a more drag on their business 
and the vines of scope creep are choking them even more. And it's really sad. I'll, I'll give another example of a construction company we work with, Darren. Uh, Darren and his business, they targeted in their business. It's very common in construction, you know, that you're going to target around about a 20, well, you'd love to have a 25%, but 20, 25% gross profit margin is the target. And they were having real cash flow challenges, massive cash flow challenges. And when we looked at things, I said, look, guys, um, you're targeting 20 to 25% gross profit margin. But when we did a few deeper looks at a few simple things, what we discovered was that their average job was closer to a 12 to 15% gross profit margin. Now you'd say, well, what's the difference? The difference is that delta, right, that delta was all their profit and they were actually running a loss. That's the difference for them. It was really, really hurting them. Really, really hurting them. Scope creep is serious. Scope creep is not about, well, I make a little bit less money. Scope creep can literally put your entire business in jeopardy. So let's we'll start with the question, how do you know if scope creep is an issue for you? You know, how do I spot, David, in my business, if you were my coach, how would you help me spot if this was an issue for me? And that's a great question to ask. Um, so I would say to you that if you have a complicated engagement that you do as a service, where you price the engagement up front, um, but then you have to do the complicated project over time, scope creep likely is something that you're dealing with without realizing it. That might be an engineering firm or a consulting firm, right? If you make a complicated product, you're, you manufacture a complicated product where it's custom for different customers, and you price it up front to create design and then to build whatever widget that it is, scope creep is likely an issue for you. You'll notice that the first type of scope creep comes when you have to come up with a price up front for a scope of work that's complicated that later on is delivered. So if you do something, whether you build something or you, you do a service offering where it's complicated to produce and deliver it, whether it's complicated by how it's, you're interacting with a, a client and how they have to give you back information or you don't have all the facts until you dive in, or it's one such that it's just the marketplace. To get them a result is tricky. You've got to make adjustments, a little bit of trial and error to make the, re make the result what they want. Scope keep creep is probably an issue for you. We'll talk about how do you defend against scope creep, how do you preempt scope creep, how do you deal with it and combat it when it comes up, but that's likely the case. A second type of case would be if you do a recurring service for a body of clients and um, that that, that service offering has at different times that people ask for one time something more different. I use one time in quotation marks because that one time request often gets repeated multiple times across many different customers or um, by the same customer or client. An example might be uh, uh, if you had a landscaping business, for example. Let's say you do commercial landscaping and you priced out to do the landscaping for this office park and you, you, you're charging, I'll make up a number here, uh, $12,000 a month. But you do this across multiple different office parks or buildings, but what about things like if there's a storm and there's a downed tree, or a uh, new bush need to be planted, or, uh, or some kind of irrigation challenge that you need to deal with? What'll happen is you'll say, oh, okay, we'll just handle it. You know, it's a storm, we need to be there for our clients, we'll just handle it. And their gross profit margin is eroded, which means their operating profit has eroded, and enough times, it's rarely one-off. It might be one-off in that instance, but there's a pattern that happens with that part. So if you do a recurring service for a set fee without really robust ways of charging, upcharging for the extras that are on top, scope keep is most likely an issue for you. Third, if you sell a product, but you commonly offer value-add service after you sell the product, I can almost guarantee that scope creep is likely an issue for you. I'll give an example for that. One of the people we work with, he runs, a, he sells industrial parts for water treatment facilities. Um, and so when he sells these very expensive pumps and filtration systems, he as an engineer will then service the job that he sold. He made his profit from selling this product. He might sell several million dollars to a water treatment uh, or a municipality, but he then has to service for years afterwards. And if he's not careful and doesn't put a price to that, 
he ends up doing all this work and what he thought he made became less and less and less. Scope creep comes in. If you're a service business that also deals in hardware, here's a common pattern that I see. You know, like an IT service business. I, I know we work with a, a company I'll, I'll share about here, Brian. And Brian had an IT services business. Um, he would work with school districts. Well, his field to crew would be out working at the various schools uh, in a district. And he would realize that the field technician would say, well, we need to have better routers in here and we need Wi-Fi boosters through the school. And so they would take uh, hardware that they either had in their truck or even worse, they would go and get it at the local you know, Staples or office supply store. And they would install that stuff, but they would forget to actually put down record that so the client never got invoiced for it. You notice here when you have technicians or staff who do the client work, but there's no connection for them to how the client pays and what the client pays. There's no skin in the game for them to give this person extra. Man, that's an issue. Like I'll give an example. You know, I, as I've gotten older, I started wearing glasses. Here are the glasses that I, I just recently bought. So I went to a, a place um, to get the glasses and without even me asking, as I was going to be rung up, the woman pulled out from a drawer a whole bunch of coupons and she started scanning coupons and gave me I, you know, equivalent of probably about 15% off on my glasses. And I bought four pairs um, because I don't like losing them. I'd like to have multiple so that by the time I find one, I have the other one I've just lost and it kind of works out well. But she gave me 15% off, which I wasn't complaining about it. But here's what I know as a business coach watching that. She's never had training on the cost of her just offering the 15% off that I, I didn't ask for, I didn't expect. And I would have been just as happy without it. Now, once she gave it to me, the next time I go to buy glasses at her store, she's trained me to say, hey, where are the coupons from the drawer? You know, I'd like to save several hundred dollars. Thank you. She's got no skin in the game. We'll come back and talk about how do we do that through staff training, through, through culture, through compensation, but such that if she did that now with enough customers over the course of a month, she might have cost that business five, six thousand dollars that month where she didn't make anybody happier and all she did was hurt the business. That's a way when she's offering that, she's in a sense giving scope creep in many, one way of looking at that. So what should we do about it, right? How do we handle that? I want to go through seven, I might even give you a bonus eight or nine, but I'm going to go through seven different ways to combat scope creep. The first one is probably the most important. You've got to bring awareness to it. You know, when you look at scope creep, the biggest thing is most business owners don't have any real awareness of the problem or the magnitude of the problem. Um, but when you do a quick analysis and you look for the commonalities, for example, when you sell your typical service offering and you produce X, Y, and Z, is it very common that a percentage of your customers also ask for A and B as well? If that's the case, just by noticing that and realizing that, we know that we need to either package in A and B because people are going to ask for it, or at the very least, let them know that if they do want to upgrade to A and B later, there will be a price for that, a cost, a, an upcharge for those parts. And we agree on that up front, and it's reinforced over time. I'll get to that in a moment. I might find that maybe I'm expecting that some people, you know, with my customers, they might have a pattern wherein, like, this happens to builders all the time. I want you to build this for me. As they're doing the building, like, oh, no, I don't really like it. I really realize that I need this counter to be this way. I need the staircase to be this way. I mean, we make jokes about it. You know, David, you know, your stairs, you've got 10 stairs going up. I think you should make each stair one inch shorter and build an 11 step on it. I think it would just be much more feng shui. I mean, customers say crazy things with that. If you can notice what types of things go on with that, just the awareness of these patterns where customers regularly want to change their mind along the way, we can deal with that preemptively and strategically when it comes up both. You know, when your team consistently gives your customers or your clients extra product or service time, which have a cost, but you don't account for it, and they give it in a way that the client is not extra happy for it or it's not strategic, we want to analyze what's going on so they have awareness. The, the single biggest thing I see from watching business owners, again, I, I would put this out here, when I look at the dozen companies that I've been an equity player in, scaled and grown, some have been wildly successful, a few have failed, and, and some have been marginally successful in between there. I've learned a certain amount. 
But when I look at the thousands of businesses that I've gotten a chance to work with over the last 25, 27, 28 years, I've learned 100x more from that part. And here's one of those coaching insights I want to share with you for you as a business owner. Business owners commonly go to the extremes. Awareness for them is either the extreme of what I'll call Pollyanna. It's okay. It's a wonderful thing. Don't worry about it. This, it everything's wonderful. And they ignore trouble spots in the business. Or they make everything worse than it is. The sky is falling. This is horrible. They create all the stress. They scare away team members. I want you to train to be neutral. That in your business, yes, I want you to have moments of celebration. Yes, you're going to have moments where you're upset. But the more you can look at your business and have that awareness about, in this case, scope creep, with an objective, neutral frame of what actually are we dealing with here? How much is it costing us over the last 12 months? If we don't fix it, what's it likely to cost us over the next 12, 24 months? And when a business does this, they say, wow, you know, scope creep has cost us, for example, a builder might say, it cost me $750,000 last year from scope creep, from changes to projects that I never, you know, did a, a work order change, never charged for, didn't really think about it. It just, for me, I was just trying to, to not upset a client to, to make them happy. 750000 Now, this might be a builder who made last year 200000 which means that, that they lost out on, they could have three times, four times their profitability by just doing scope creep right, dealing with it right. And going forward, they can say, projecting, that's going to cost me another one and a half to $2 million over the next two years if I don't deal with it. So if I can just be aware of this or the patterns and say, here's what it's actually costing me, now I can make an intelligent series of decisions about what will I do with that. The business owners that we coach that are the most successful look at the facts on the ground objectively. They're willing to say that I'm not going to make it better than it is. I'm not going to make it worse than it is. I'm going to look at what it actually is. And then I'm going to deal with it. Awareness is the first one. Determine what kind of scope creep is going on and what it's currently costing you. Number two, um, you've got to price scope creep in up front. So for example, that builder, if he notices that people consistently, uh, you know, 20, 30% of his customers consistently ask for changes partway through the process, up front with his customer, he needs to have that conversation saying, hey, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, here's what we've designed for you. You've signed off on the design. We'll build this for you. As we know, we've agreed on a price of you know, $650,000 for you to build this home for, for you. Now, along the way, you guys are going to have some choices. Along the way, you're going to have some, some times that you might want changes. Anytime that you want to change, I will let you know, and I'll actually price it out in writing so that any of those changes you want, you can make a determined choice knowing how it affects the budget. And I'll always, when you ask for a change, not only will I price it out, but I'll put that price out into the budget and I'll come back and share both the price of that change and how it affects the budget and timeline so that you can make a good decision about that. If you ever want my input for it just because, you know, hey, I've built hundreds of homes for customers and I know what makes them happy on the, on the side after the build out is done, um, please ask me. If you don't, I'll do it however you want. And just note that one of the patterns I see is that many homeowners, while the house is being built, they want to make changes for small reasons, and invariably it drives up the budget, it takes longer to do, and the irony is they're not happier at the end. But again, if you want to change anything, I'll give it to you in writing. I'll redo the budget of timeline and cost so you can see and make a decision with your eyes open. Fair enough. What I've done is I preempted, I brought to them that it's going to be costing them more. It's, it's not later on like it's a new subject. I, I'm going to, I've, I've addressed this and dealt with this up front. Now, I can't just do it one time. I've got to tie this down again and again. If I just give it to someone along the way, they're going to expect me to give it to them again and again with that part. So I might also see that commonly what's going on um, is that when people want for my service offering, they want X and Y, almost always at least half the people, maybe even 70% of the people want Z as well. So hey, I know you're asking for X and Y. I'm going to tell you that 50, 70% of our, our clients also find that they want Z as well. If you want us to do this for you monthly up front, um, X and Y will be $12,000 per month for you to do that. We're happy to do that. I think you're going to want and need Z. If you want to add Z later on as an a la carte item, 
it's going to be an extra $5,000 per month. We've learned that that's the, the price where we can produce it in a quality way for you by adding it later. Um, that would take your $12,000 and make it seventeen. If you want to have it from the start, which I would encourage you to consider, rather than seventeen down the road, it'll be $15,000 up you know, on a monthly basis starting off that way. Why? Because by bundling it in, it's more efficient for us to do that from the start versus having to layer it in later on. And we can pass that savings on to you in the form of a, of a better price. Right? I'm preempting by having the conversation up front about that. Important for that. Um, at the very least, I've created an a la carte thing. So if I know it commonly, let's say I'm producing a, a product, and they're going to buy products A and B for me for a certain price. And I can tell them, I say, hey, look, this is great. When people buy product A and B, commonly they also want service X and service Y. And, and even sometimes they really find that they later on need product Z. It, if you want these later on, here's what the price will be to add that later, just for you to be aware of. right? So I give this to them, not just out loud, but I actually give them a menu so that they know what the price is for things. So later on when they say, hey, you had told me before about this product Z. I'm thinking I'm wanting to upgrade. Great, like I'd share with you, um, here's what the pricing for that is. Now, if ever I do a price, like, please, minor coaching point, but just please, please, please put a, a valid through or some other way to make sure that there's a date that this is accurate through. Right? I don't want somebody to look at like a, a pricing sheet from three years ago and say, well, you said, David, it was going to be $26,000 three years ago. Today it might be $32,000, right? So make sure you somehow have either a valid through or some notification on the price that says, for the most current updated such and such, you know, you know, call us or check out our website for the most current version of that, right? Something to preempt them later on being upset with it. Now, what about the times that you want to give them? So let's say you choose that you really do want to give them service Y for free. If I just give it to them for free, they won't value it. But if I give it to them where I say, hey, you're going to get service Z, let me give you an invoice. And in that invoice, I say service, you know, whatever the, whatever the service is, service Y, whatever that actually is. And the price for that is $8,500. I can always put on the bottom of that invoice one time complimentary, right? I can always say that it's free for that one time, but by giving them an invoice that has a number to it, by putting a price to it, I'm, I'm, I'm letting them know that they just got an expensive gift. And by noting it's a one-time piece, not an expectation that every single time you'll do that, you're again, you're defending in, against scope creep. And that's really important, really important. Um, third way that you combat scope creep, Pick your customers wisely. <laughs> Some customers, you, they're really difficult to make them happy. If you were to look at the companies that you do business with or the individuals that are clients of yours, I can almost guarantee you that you would find that there's a percentage that are wonderful, your A bucket people. And then there's a percentage <clears throat> that are somewhere in the middle. And then there's a percentage, anywhere from 10 to 40% of your customers or clients, that are difficult to work with, lower margins, more demanding, more scope creep when you look at it. Part of what you need to do as a business is, how do I take my C bucket customers and either convert them into A bucket customers, or at the very least, if I can't make them A bucket customers, can I make them B bucket customers? How do I take and convert them? Right. So I, I get rid of C by making them A or B. Or if I can't do that, and by the way, how do I convert a C customer into an A or B? By right-sizing the delivery of what I charge for what they receive, by getting rid of scope creep, either by reducing services and or product given or charging more. Right? That's, that's really it. And by having a conversation where you talk about expectations and how in the relationship, if it's ongoing, that you want to take care of these needs for them, but you also have needs like timely payment. Um, and if they want extras, which you're very willing to do, it's going to have to be scheduled in in a way that's efficient. 
and also it's going to be charged and paid for, right? They're, going to, they're not going to just get it for free. So if I can't do that with bucket C people, over time, the way I diminish them is I simply, I fire them. Now, I don't fire them all at once. But what I might do is I might say a third of my bucket C customers this quarter, I'm going to either increase pricing on them or I'm going to reduce services offers for the same price if they want or I'm going to tell them and be clear on that, hey, we need payment up front before we do any more work for you because you've historically been you know, 90 days to 180 days late on the receivable, right? However you're going to deal with that. If they don't agree to those things, say, I totally understand we're not the right company for you to do business with. You should work with somebody else. So either they go to A or B bucket or you fire them and you do that in waves. You don't do it all at once. You learn by doing it in waves plus any of the negative impacts you'll mitigate. And the cool thing is, is what I invariably find almost in all instances, when you get rid of bucket C, you free up a lot of capacity and a lot of attention, which allows you to go out and find more A bucket customers and to actually produce and, and do your work for more A bucket clients and A bucket pro, um, projects. Really important. We also have to train our team. The fourth way to combat attrition has nothing to do with the customer and has everything to do with your staff. Remember that woman I said who, who was there at the glass company, at the, at the eyeglass store? She just pulled, she, she's found that she made, made, made people like her better by simply giving them the coupon without them ever asking for it. Now, that might make her feel better, people like me, but it hurts the business. Um, and I think that's really important. Why does it, they, they need to know why it matters. Hey, Sheila, when you're doing that, here's where it matters. You know, over time, we're less profitable. And if we're less profitable, I can't give you a raise. Um, we can't have some nice features like in the break room where once a week we'll bring in lunch. I can't do those things if we don't maintain our profit margins from that part. Obviously, if a customer comes in with a coupon, we're going to honor the coupon. But for a customer who's not expecting it, for you to dig it out, now you're training them to basically get a discount on everything they buy. And that hurts us. So one is I just need to show them why it matters. I need to teach them how they should handle it. Like, for example, let's say I've got a field technician who's out there doing a, a, some kind of blue collar service. Let's go back to our landscaper. You know, I've got uh, um, um, Paolo is, is, is the, the crew chief that runs, you know, a, a, an eight man crew that does uh, for this big office park for several of them. He's the one that's in charge of, of, of running the field team. And the building supervisor comes out and says, hey, um, you know, we have some downed trees. We need to take care of them. If I've never talked with Paolo about how to handle that, on his own, he's just going to probably do what he thinks is right, which is just to, great, we'll get rid of them. What he should be doing is saying something along the lines that, depending if you want him to do the upsell or do you want an account manager to come back out and do that and price it, it, it probably depends on how serious the work is, you know, how big, big the scope of it is. And it probably also depends on how skilled Paulo is or could be. In a simple case like that, it might be well, Paulo can say, hey, you know, that's probably going to be somewhere between 8 to 12 uh, labor hours from that, um, which at, uh, at, at, at $90 per hour per labor hour is going to mean this much. And then the hauling and the removal side and, and the equipment component will be another you know, $1,500. So your total will be, and I'm, again, I'm just making up a number here, you know, $3,200 and we can get those done. I can either take care of them this afternoon or um, we can come back and do that not tomorrow on Tuesday, but we can come back on Wednesday morning. My suggestion is it's a liability. If we can get rid of them today, that would be my preference. Uh, I, I will adjust from that. But if you can't have it be today, I can do it on Wednesday. right? So if I've trained Paulo about how to handle that, I'm not just doing $3,500 worth of work for free. I'm doing $3,500 worth of work with a reasonable profit margin and collecting on that part of it. Really important. Number five. I have to refine my systems to make scope creep obvious and how to combat it. So for example, um, I've got people in the field doing work. I have to have some kind of inventory controls. You know, what do they have in their, in their truck? And every time they, they use a piece of equipment, they need to make sure that they record it in such a fashion that we bill it through to the client. Really important for things like that. Another example is uh, with refining our systems might be about decision authority you might decide that a field tech has a certain amount of discretion for things less than $500. So 
But if it's something that's going to cost more than $500, they need to bring uh, either a supervisor or perhaps the client's account manager for your company to go out there and actually price it properly so that they know what they're getting and actually get them to pay for what you're doing. Um, might be in the pricing tool. Notoriously, one place that you lose margin is before you ever produce the service offering, it's scope creep that happens in the sale itself. Um, you know, you've got uh, Sherry who goes out and does a great job selling, but what she doesn't realize is, is that she consistently is supposed to sell X and she gives out extra for the same price at the point of sale. She doesn't estimate or she doesn't price properly. By better systems training and also pricing tools, which would be a form of a sales control, what you're doing is you're helping to make sure that she prices correctly from the start. Otherwise, you can introduce scope creep in the sales process before you've ever delivered a, a, an instance or any of your product or service. Number six, you're most vulnerable when you have producers in the field or producers in an office that work with clients, service delivery people, who have no connection with the actual uh, profitability. So when I've got somebody who's actually producing the work, service delivery, field techs, whatever, producing the work, but there's a big buffer or isolation where they have no, no connection about profitability, right? No connection between profitability. That's when you're most vulnerable. They, they don't have any skin in the game. Now, skin in the game can be formally, they can have skin in the game through how you do compensation, right? Um, it can be about internal standards that they have skin in the game, which means that uh, if their performance is being evaluated, where, where profitability or gross profit is a piece of that, or controlling scope creep is a piece of that, their compensation can be directly about that. Um, but it can also be about just even, um, and these are formal ways of doing it, what are some informal? These are formal. Some informal ways of doing that would include you know, better training for your staff so that they have an understanding that if they have scope creep go on, it's going to hurt the company. And ultimately, if it hurts the company, it hurts their peers, colleagues, and it hurts them and their family because it impacts what the company can do sustainably, how it can serve more customers, how it deals with their long-term ability to progress in their career earn more, have more autonomy, authority, et cetera. And if we can, we can also make it visible to them. Hey, here's where we stand in terms of gross profit as a margin. Our standard, our target is to hit at least 40% gross profit margin on, on this type of work. Right now, we've dropped that down to 32%. We've got to fix that going forward. Going forward, that's not okay. It doesn't mean, we've got to make scope creep visible. And the last one is we, we want to build this into our culture where it's not just you, the owner, out there fighting by yourself a fire of scope creep, carrying around a bucket of water, rushing around to find somewhere to throw it on. No, we want a whole line of people passing bucket to bucket to bucket so that we can efficiently and effectively deal with scope creep as an entire team. Really important. Seventh way we combat scope creep, have a minimum gross profit, a minimum threshold for your gross profit, minimum, and you're also going to want what your target is as well. And you're going to want to make sure that you make that visible to people who are leaders in the business, and ideally even to people doing the work in some fashion, such that, that they can impact and know that their target, you've created standards for those targets, that they can have a connection between the work that they produce and profitability. We can't just have them in isolation. Remember, please, 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 when you notice scope creep in your business, your intuitive response is going to be sell more. I need more volume. But if scope creep is an issue, more volume is only going to expose the issue even worse, and it's going to be even more dangerous for the business. We've got to solve the underlying profitability issue, which is our gross profit margin. Um, yeah, I'm going to give one more here, which is one of the better solutions is not to sell more but to charge properly, to charge fairly. What that means is if we're going to produce more for them, we have to charge for that. If our gross profit margin is off and they don't want to pay more, we've got to deliver less where they agree upon that up front. Or 
we've got to have that customer work for somebody else. We don't want low or negative margin business. We just we can't afford it. It soaks up way too much issues, too much attention, too much of our capacity. And here's the thing that I've noticed. Most times, those low margin customers, those low margin projects are the ones that are the most demanding and have the most wear and tear on your staff. And they're just not worth it. So these are ways to spot scope creep, combat scope creep. In the next week's episode, I want to go into and I want to share with you a, an example of how do, I, how do I manage this communication through, whether it be about scope creep or managing any kind of long-term relationship, whether it's internal to my customer and my company or with external suppliers, vendors, or, or customers or clients. We're going to go through and talk about that. I'm going to give a case study on that. And it directly bears into the scope creep part. So if you're thinking that scope creep has some foothold in your business, please make sure you come back next week to watch the next episode or to listen through the next episode because I'm going to share with you something we call the accountability loop. It's a communication framework for you to have this ongoing, to navigate gracefully this ongoing conversation about expectations and right-sizing relationships. And it really is a significant and important thing to do. Good luck with you for combating scope creep, and thanks for joining me today.